Okay then, so we're going to have a look at the book of Ezekiel, and it's a huge book, so we have a huge task on our hands. So I guess all we can do really in the time that we have is have a taste of the book of Ezekiel. So turn with me to the book itself, and first of all, we need to be clear that Ezekiel uh, was amongst the, the first group of people to be taken from Jerusalem into exile. So you may remember when we looked at the books of history that uh, Jerusalem and uh, its surrounding regions were destroyed by the Babylon, uh, Babylonians over a period of about 20 years. And there were three moments when um, the people of Jerusalem were taken, three occasions. So Ezekiel is amongst the first group of exiles. He's taken into Babylon and from Babylon he is given um, a series of visions and a word from God for the people who, who are still living in Jerusalem. So he writes back, he sends the word of God back uh, to those living in Jerusalem. And uh, when Ezekiel is in Babylon there will be a second wave of captives and there'll be a third wave of captives and Ezekiel uh, hears about and warns about the final destruction uh, of Jerusalem itself. So don't let's bear that in mind because we have a prolonged captivity, we have a staged occupation of Jerusalem and um, the, the taking into Babylon of the people of God. So Ezekiel then is in Babylon and the book itself falls very nicely into three sections. And the first section from chapter one through to chapter 24, so as you click through the, the, the pages you can see the first section uh, deals with Ezekiel's word to the people at Jerusalem. He's warning them, those who've been left behind in Jerusalem, he's warning them of the judgment of God and the wrath of God that will fall against them. So the first section is often titled uh, Ezekiel against Jerusalem. Then in chapter five, 25 in the first verse, you have this famous uh, introductory type phrase, the word of the Lord came to me saying, so here's the second section of the book beginning. And the second section extends to chapter 32. And this is uh, Ezekiel against the nations. So very much like uh, Isaiah, again, like Jeremiah, Ezekiel then brings the word of God against the surrounding nations and uh, including Babylon itself. So here is God once again, uh, extending his wrath, extending his remit to the surrounding nations of the world. <coughs> and then you have the final section, which is chapter 33 and the first verse. And here's again our phrase, the word of the Lord came to me saying, and that third section of Ezekiel extends to the end of the book. And this third section is very optimistic, it's quite hopeful, because the third section deals with the new temple, deals with the idea of God revisiting his people and setting up his home with them again. So for those of you who've joined a bit late, book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel is in Babylon, He's amongst the first wave of captives to have been taken into Babylon, and the book has these three sections. The first section against Jerusalem, chapters 1 to 24. The second section, uh, Ezekiel against the nations, chapter 25 to 32. And then the third section, the, the new temple, the restoration, uh, is chapters uh, 33 to 48. That's the division of the, the book itself. And then what you have in Ezekiel is generally agreed to be six visions. So these visions are interspersed into the book as a whole. 
And there's some debate about where the visions begin and end. It's not necessarily clear. So there's a consensus of opinion. There'll be some differences, but there's a consensus that the six visions fall like this. So the first vision, very famously, is chapter one into chapter three uh, to the end of chapter three, verse 27. And it's the vision that's called the throne vision. It's the vision of God that Ezekiel has when he is first called uh, by God uh, to be a prophet. And it's called a throne vision because it, it presents us with uh, Ezekiel's encounter with God and uh, because God cannot be seen and God cannot be described, the vision uses language that is borrowed from the temple. And uh, it's, it's borrowed from Solomon's temple in, the, um, in Jerusalem. So sometimes it's even called the temple vision. And uh, it's a vision of God in his glory, in his majesty, and it's God calling Ezekiel to go to the people of Israel. He doesn't go literally, of course, he, he, because he's in Babylon, but he's called to minister to the people of Israel. So it's very much like Isaiah, when Isaiah is in the temple and he has a vision in chapter 6 of the Lord high and lifted up. This is an, an elaboration of Isaiah's experience. It is Isaiah's uh, vision put into apocryphal. Uh, language put into the language of judgment and mystery uh, uh, and exile but very much fashioned on Isaiah's experience so sure, I'm sure most of you know how this vision begins chapter 1 then and verse 4 then I looked and behold a whirlwind was coming out of the north now that's hugely significant that it comes out of the north and behold, a great cloud with raging fire engulfing itself, and brightness was all around it, and radiating out of its midst like the colour of amber. And from within it came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man, each one had four faces, each one had four wings, their legs were straight and the soles of their feet. And then you've got the idea of wings touching one another. And then, of course, you've got the circles with the, the, the eyes, the wheels in verse 16. It's a vision of God. And the fact that it comes out from the north is uh, in keeping with lots of myths and legends of the time about the gods and where the gods were believed to have come from. So it's very interesting that this vision takes Isaiah's call as its biblical reference point, but it's also couched in the language of the gods, particularly the Babylonian gods. So this is the first of the visions then, and uh, it sets up the prophecy as a whole. Then you've got the second vision. Now the second vision is uh, chapter 8 uh, into chapter 10, and this second vision is known as the temple vision, and in this vision, you see God departing the temple of Jerusalem. The presence of God and the glory of God is leaving the temple at Jerusalem. So remember now, we discussed this, I think, when we looked at Lamentations. The temple in Jerusalem is the place where heaven and earth meet. It's God's foothold on the earth. It's the symbol and the containment of the presence of God. Well, in this second vision, God departs the temple. Uh, don't forget now, there's the, the uh, people of, of God who have been left behind in Jerusalem, so they would still be there. But here is Ezekiel envisioned, envisioning God departing. So chapter 8 and verse 1, It came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, on the fifth day of the month, I was sat in my house, with the elders of Judah sitting before me, that the hand of the Lord fell upon me there. And I looked, and there was a likeness, like the appearance of fire. And it's a man covered in fire. And as you go into chapter 10 of this vision, you get the most important verse, which is verse 4. 
Then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub and paused over the threshold of the temple and the house was filled with the cloud and the court was full of the brightness of the Lord's glory and the sound of the wings of the cherubim was heard and the glory departs. So here it is again the language of cherubs, the language of the Holy of Holies, the language of the Ark of the Covenant, which is overspread with the, the mercy seat. All this is the language of the vision. And in this second vision, God departs his temple. That's the second vision. Then what you have is, uh, it's called the third vision, but it's a series of images. It's a series of uh, moments in which uh, Ezekiel has certain pictures, uh, images presented to him by God, and each image is a description of the condition of the people of Israel, either their present condition or its descriptions of their past conditions. So this third vision, or rather series of images, runs from chapter 15 and it runs into chapter 19. And uh, some of them are very interesting images. You've got traditional images like the vine, uh, you've got the images of uh, the foolish people. But the, the, ch the chapter that always stands out for me here is chapter 16. So let's just take a moment to look at chapter 16 of Ezekiel. So from the first verse then, again the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations. And say, this, thus says the Lord God to Jerusalem, your birth and your nativity are from the land of Canaan. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. And what you have then is an image of a newborn baby. But look how violent and how disturbing the image is. As for your nativity, and on the day you were born, your navel cord was not cut, nor were you washed in water to cleanse you. You were not rubbed with salt nor wrapped in swaddling cloths. No, I pitied you to do any of these things for you, to have compassion on you, but you were thrown out into the open field when you yourself were loathed on the day when you were born. It's, a, it's an image of an abandoned newborn baby. Just born, uh, covered in blood, uh, with the umbilical cord still present, and this newborn baby abandoned in the field, this is the imagery of the, the origins of the people of God, the origins of, of uh, Israel. And as you look in the next verse, verse 6, When I passed by you and saw you struggling in your own blood, I said to you, in your blood, live. Yes, I said to you, in your blood, live. And I made you like a plant in the field, and you grew mature. So God is a passing stranger who sees an abandoned baby uh, in, the, in the field, takes that baby and nurtures the baby and causes the baby to thrive. That's a image of the relationship between God and Israel. And of course, the baby will grow up <clears throat> and the baby will be ungrateful. The baby will reject its parents. And as you look at that image in chapter 16, it's the image of washing, clothing, nurturing, beautifying, adorning this baby as the baby grows with everything that this uh, passerby can give, everything that God gives, he gives to Israel. But, verse 15, here's the contrast, you trusted in your own beauty, you played the harlot. So this female baby then, as it turns out, becomes a prostitute. And that's the imagery in this third vision or third set of images. Then the fourth of the visions is a very famous one. We had somebody re referring to it before we started. And that's chapter 37. And it's the image or, or the vision of the valley of the dry bones. And uh, if there was ever... Um, a, a vision or a passage of scripture that had been misinterpreted, it's this one. So turn to chapter 37, and here's the valley of the dry bones. Verse 3. Son of man, can these bones live? 
So there was a very many bones uh, in an open valley and they were very dry. So the idea is that um, there's been a battle and the corpses have been allowed to decay on the battle. The, the flesh is gone, the bones are left, the bones are bleached by the sun, they bleached by the wind. So a huge period of time has passed from the battle to the moment when the prophet looks upon the battlefield and he sees the dry bones. He then hears the voice of God, can these bones live? And he replies, oh Lord, you know, and this echoes there, uh, just uh, in passing, there's echoes there of what Peter was saying to Jesus uh, when uh, Jesus says to him, do you love me? And he says, Lord, you know. Anyway, back to this. Uh, verse four, he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. And then you get the unfolding vision. And the unfolding vision is of uh, the medical nature of how uh, sinews are attached to bones, muscles are attached to sinews, blood vessels permeate the whole, skin overlays the whole thing. So you get what we would be very familiar with in modern science or even in, in modern films. You get layer upon layer upon layer um, uh, in the vision of Ezekiel. He sees the first layer, then he sees the second layer, then he sees the third layer, then the skin on top, and then you've got perfectly formed bodies but they're dead and can these dead bodies live can breath come into them uh, verse 10 and of course at the word of the Lord breath then comes into these bodies verse 14 I will put my spirit in you and you shall live and I will place you into your own land and of course then you've got living breathing uh, human beings whom God will place into their own land end of verse 14 then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it. That's the vision of the dry bones, the valley of the dry bones. What does it mean? Well, that's where you get all the fun of people seeking to interpret what that means. So that's your fourth vision. You've got two left. Chapter 38 uh, into chapter 39, you've got the vision of Gog Magog. Now, the Hebrew has gone through a little bit of a journey in its translation. Uh, you know the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew, and then from the Greek you get, I guess, the English, you know, over centuries. The actual Hebrew is not Gog and Magog. Uh, the Hebrew is Gog Magog. It's Gog of Magog or Gog Magog as one phrase. So you have uh, this vision of Gog Magog. And Gog Magog is the ultimate enemy from the north. It's the um, horrors of the, the ultimate enemy, the, the final enemy um, of the people of God. And uh, as you look at these two chapters, look at verse 2, 38. Chapter 38, verse 2. Son of man, set your face against Gog of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him, saying, now this Gog Magog is a person. Um, in, in some traditions, Gog Magog is a land, but he seems to be a person. And this is what you have to say to him. I will turn you around and put hooks into your jaws and lead you out with all your army, horses and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, Persia, Ethiopia, Libya, all of this, okay, is going to be a, a, a big, massive confrontation. What, who is Gog Magog, okay? And um, Gog Magog has become a symbol uh, in the book of Revelation of the Antichrist and the final moments. And uh, can I just ask you to, to take a look at some of the Gog Magog references that we have in our Bibles. So we need to start in the book of Genesis <clears throat> and in Genesis 10 and uh, verse 2 we've got our first reference to Gog Magog and uh, interesting if you look at Genesis 10 and verse 2 that the sons of Japheth, so remember Noah's sons, uh, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the sons of Japheth were Gomer, and there it is, Magog. 
Gog Magog. So you have the first reference to Gog Magog as a descendant of Noah. In fact, I suppose you could say a great grandson of Noah. But then in the very final book of our Bibles, the book of Revelation, we have another reference to Gog Magog. So turn to Revelation and uh, chapter 20 and uh, verse 8. <clears throat> and again, in the, in the Greek here, it's Gog Magog. Let's start at verse 7. So Revelation 20, verse 7. Now, when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog Magog, to gather them together to battle whose number is as the sand of the sea. And here God may God is nations. Person in Ezekiel, an actual living human being in, in Genesis. And uh, the, the great challenge in Ezekiel and in Revelation is to make sense of God may God. So the, the, in short, the, the, the idea is God may God becomes the symbol for the ultimate enemy of the people of God. Satan may be, in Ezekiel's day, it's Babylon. Uh, and what will happen, of course, it, both in the vision and in Revelation, is that Gog, Magog, is ultimately defeated. That's your fifth vision. We go in very quickly. Let's keep going, though. The final vision in the book of Ezekiel is from chapter 40. And it extends into chapter 48. And it's a vision of the return of the presence of God to the temple or to, to a new temple. So uh, Ezekiel 40, uh, God takes him, verse 2. So in the visions of God, he took me into the land of Israel and set me on a very high mountain. On it toward the south was something like the structure of a city. So here's Ezekiel in the land of Babylon having a vision. He is looking south in Israel towards Jerusalem, and he sees what looks like a city. So he's having a vision of the new Jerusalem, what Jerusalem will look like. It's unformed. It looks like it's got the visionary aspect of a city, but it's got that hazy, fuzzy kind of appearance that's characteristic to vision. He took me there, and behold, there was a man whose appearance was like, the appearance of bronze, he had a line of flax and a measuring rod in his hand, and he stood in the gateway, and he said to me, Son of man, look with your eyes, hear with your ears, fix your mind on everything I will show you, for you were brought here so that I might show them to you, declare to the house of Israel, consider it everything you see. Verse 5, there was a wall all around and outside the temple. Here is a man, a visionary man, who's going to rebuild the temple. And this is the sixth vision. And as you go across into chapter 43, you've got verses two and three. Chapter 43 then, and uh, verses two and three. And behold, the glory of God of Israel came down from the way of the east. His voice was like the sound of many waters and the earth shone with his glory. It was like the appearance of the vision which I saw, like the, like the vision which I saw when I came to destroy the city. The visions were like the vision which I saw by the river Chiba, and I fell on my face. It's got echoes of the first vision, that one in chapter one. But what's the difference? Did you notice a difference? So when we look at the first vision, chapter one, the, the, the four faces, the uh, appearance of a man, the wings, the feet, the big wheels, I said to you then something about that vision. Uh, here is a, a reference back to it here, but there's a very important distinction. And the very important distinction is telling us that this, the presence of God that's returning now to the temple is here to stay. This, the, 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 the presence of God comes back, and as he comes back, then the temple is to be rebuilt, and there's all the rules now about how the temple will look, what the gates will be like, what those working in the temple will be like, what the city surrounding the temple will be like, what the districts will be like, 
how the priests will behave, what the feasts are going to be like, how they're going to do the offerings. Now that should remind you of Moses and how Moses was given the, the instructions to build the temple, uh, you know, the, 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 the covenant with Moses and how it would all look and what the priests would be like. Well, well, Ezekiel is having the same. He's having the instructions from God about the new temple, the new priesthood, the new sacrifices, and the new system. You, very, very reminiscent of Moses on Mount Sinai and the laying out of all the, the instructions and the rules around the covenant. And that is the sixth and the final vision that Ezekiel has. And look at the end of his book. So chapter 48, verses 30. These are the exits of the city. So you've got exits and you've got gates. You've got the east side, the south side, the west side of the gates and the walls of the city. And then the final verse, verse 35. All the way around shall be 18,000 cubits, and the name of the city from that day shall be the Lord is there. The presence of the Lord is there. And that's how the book ends. The book begins with the presence of the Lord leaving. So you saw in that second vision how Ezekiel watches the presence of the Lord rise and depart from the temple. And then, of course, the book ends with a new temple and a new Jerusalem, having known the presence of God come back and become permanent uh, in this new temple and new city. And there, the presence of God will rest. Now, it's not difficult, is it, to work out how Revelation will also do this thing. It'll do uh, the New Jerusalem, its dimensions, its layout, its walls, what it will look like on the inside, what the river will be like, what the streets will be like, how they'll be paved. Um, there's no night, there's no sun. Revelation giving a vision of a new city and a new temple is virtually identical to Ezekiel, giving a new vision of a new temple and a new city wherein the presence of God is found and where the people of God shall live forever. So Revelation and Ezekiel mirror one another in the, the visions of the temple, the city, the presence of God and the people of God. Very, very important to put Ezekiel and Revelation together as they mirror one another in this way. So those are the six visions, and uh, I guess it's not um, difficult then to work out that the major theme in the book of Ezekiel is the theme of the presence of God. The presence of God is lost at the beginning of the book as the glory departs, and then the presence of God is re-established at the end of the book. And God will be present forever then with his people. So that's a hugely uh, important theme, uh, the presence of God. We've also got this idea of the links um, to the book of Revelation. So both Ezekiel and Revelation are apocalyptic. Um, they are examples of apocalyptic literature in the Bible. So it's to do with visions and symbols, hidden mysteries, mysteries that are communicated to us in ways that make it difficult to interpret. Uh, you cannot be certain of any particular interpretation. You have to get used to dealing with mystery in, in apocalyptic literature, communicated by dreams, by visions. So Ezekiel, Revelation, place them side by side. You've also got in um, Ezekiel a building of what we saw in the book of Jeremiah. Imagery that describes how a prophet receives the word of God himself and I want you to take a look at chapter 3 and you may remember discussing how Jeremiah 
um, is moved to write the word of God and how his friend Barak takes notes and then the scrolls are found by the king and then they have to take it to that um, female prophet to, to verify this is the scripture. So Ezekiel will tell us more about that whole process. How does a prophet receive the word of God? And he'll tell us through imagery. So look at chapter three. Verse one. <clears throat> Moreover, he said to me, son of man, eat what you find. Eat this scroll and go speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he caused me to eat that scroll. And he said to me, son of man, feed your belly and fill your stomach with this scroll. And I will give you, that I will give you. So I ate, and it was in my mouth like honey in sweetness. And then he said to me, son of man, go to the house of Israel and speak my words with them. So Ezekiel eats the word of God on a scroll, and then he speaks the word of God. And so this is an image of the process of inspiration. Uh, remember now, Timothy? Paul says all scripture is breathed out by God. Well, here is an image to describe that process. God breathes out the word of God in the form of a scroll, and Ezekiel eats that scroll, and then he speaks out the word of God. So that's a very important passage for our understanding of uh, the people of God and, and how the word of God comes to us. Last thing, just for the sake of kind of having a look at the book, is in, again in chapter three, and you've got the idea of Ezekiel as a watchman. <clears throat> so Ezekiel is being commissioned by God to go to Israel. Now don't forget, he goes metaphorically because he's in Babylon, he can't go physically. But his ministry is to Israel, to Jerusalem, to God's people. And it's really interesting, isn't it, how you can be called to have a ministry, but not in person. This might be, you know, over the airwaves, through letters, through visions, but nonetheless, it's his call. And in chapter three, he is described as a watchman. Verse 17. Son of man, I've made you a watchman for the house of Israel. They will hear a word from my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you now, Ezekiel, give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked ways to save his life. That same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. So here's God saying, Ezekiel, I'm going to send you to, as a watchman against the wicked. But if you don't speak, Ezekiel, and that man stays in his wickedness and dies in his wickedness, I'll require his blood from you, Ezekiel. Okay, that's what God says. To him. And then you get, uh, again, when a righteous man turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, verse 20, and he shall die, because you did not give him warning, he shall die in his sin, and his righteousness, which he has done, shall not be remembered, but his blood I will require at your hand. So again, God is saying to Ezekiel, if Ezekiel fails in his duties, to warn, and so the people haven't had an opportunity to repent, God will require their blood at Ezekiel's hands. Final verse, 21. If you warn the righteous man that the righteous should not sin, and he does not sin, he shall surely live because he took warning. Also, you will have delivered your soul. So Ezekiel, if you do what I tell you, and they listen to you, you will have saved your own soul, Ezekiel. So it's the idea of God placing great responsibility on Ezekiel to fulfill his ministry. If he doesn't, God will require it at his hands. Now, why am I drawing your attention to this? Because I have heard over the years sermons preached on this passage in which the preacher lays very squarely on the shoulders of the every average, ordinary, you and I, me and you, Christian, that we have a duty to witness, to be a watchman to those around us. And if we don't speak, and if we don't witness, and the people around us die in their sins, then God will require their blood at our hands. Now, I've heard this 
many times and it is completely not the case. God does not require our guilt when somebody in our family, somebody we know, somebody perhaps we work with dies without Christ. We might never have spoken to them, but God does not require guilt on our part. He does not hold their blood against us. This is a very specific responsibility placed by God on Ezekiel. It's a simple description of Ezekiel's responsibility. It is not prescribing for you and me that we have this responsibility to bear witness and the death of those without Christ is our fault. It is not telling us that. And you must never let anybody persuade you that this is what it means. Because that's a terrible burden to place on the people of God and completely untrue. Before we finish then, just to, to uh, show you, uh, I did say, didn't I, that that would be the last passage. Let's look at one more, just because we can. And in chapter 24, you get a very moving account of the death of Ezekiel's wife. Now, I should have said right at the start that there are two Babylonian prophets in our Bible. There's Ezekiel and there's Daniel. Ezekiel is the first. He goes in the first batch. And Ezekiel is known as the prophet of the people because his lot is to live amongst the ordinary captives. They live by the riverside in, in Susa. They pitch their tents along the floodplains that surrounds the river. He's living amongst them as one of them. The other Babylonian prophet is Daniel. Daniel comes on the third captive um, moment. He's amongst the third lot of, of, of captives. And Daniel will be the royal uh, prophet. He is at the top of Babylonian society. He goes into the service of the king and he becomes one of the king's counsellors. So in Babylon, you've got the ordinary Ezekiel, and you've got the royal Daniel, and they're both prophets in exile. And Ezekiel shares his life at an ordinary level, and so he eats with, and he lives with, and he dresses like the exiles. And you can go out throughout the story, and you can find moments when Ezekiel has to live out his message. Um, by dressing in certain ways, cooking his food in certain ways, is a development of the idea we saw in Jeremiah, when Jeremiah has to embody his message. Uh, he, he has to be a visual aid or um, a walking placard. Uh, so he's not just speaking the message, he has to live the message. When well, Ezekiel does the same, and he does more of it, than Jeremiah ever did. And in chapter 24, you have Ezekiel um, being told by God that God is going to kill his wife. His wife will die suddenly, but Ezekiel mustn't mourn. He must carry on. And in doing so, he's embodying a message. Let's take a look at that. So Ezekiel 24 and verse 15. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, behold, I will take away from you the desire of your eyes with one stroke. Yet you shall neither mourn nor weep, nor shall your tears run over. Sigh in silence. Make no mourning for the dead. Bind your turban on your head and put your sandals on your feet. Do not cover your lips and do not eat man's bread of sorrow. So I spoke to the people in the morning, and at the evening my wife died. And the next morning I did as I was commanded. And the people said to me, what, will you not tell us what these things mean, that you are behaving in this way? And I answered them, saying, the word of the Lord came to me, speak to the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord God, behold, I will profane my sanctuary, your arrogant boast, the desire of your eyes, the delight of your soul, and your sons and daughters whom you left behind shall fall by the sword. And you shall do as I have done. You shall not cover your lips 
nor eat man's bread of sorrows. Verse 24, Ezekiel is a sign to you, according to all that he has done, you shall do. And when this comes, you shall know that I am the Lord. And there he is as an embodiment of the idea that all that they love and all that they have left behind, they've got family who they've left behind, they've been separated from family, loved ones, uh, the temple, it's all going to go with one stroke. And when it goes, they are to carry on. Ezekiel's dress is already Babylonian with the turban and the sandals. They're going to have to carry on. They're going to have to live as Babylonians because they will have lost everything. And you know, I'm lying to you again. I got another last thing to say. In uh, Ezekiel 33, and verses 21 to 22, you've got the actual moment recorded when Jerusalem finally falls. So just take a look, and I promise now this is the last thing. Ezekiel 33, 21 and 22. Now it came to pass in the 12th year of our captivity, so he's been there 12 years then in exile, in the 10th month, on the 5th day of the month, that one who had escaped from Jerusalem came to me and said, the city has been captured. Now the hand of the Lord had been upon me that evening before the man came who had escaped and he had opened my mouth. So when he came to me in the morning, my mouth was opened and I was no longer mute. Ezekiel had been made mute by God because he had found the message too difficult to deliver. And here the man comes, he's an escapee, very much like in Samuel, when an escapee came to, set, to tell um, um, Eli that the ark had been captured. You've got this idea of one person running, running, running to say, and they get the calamitous news, and then you get this moment of significance. And uh, Ezekiel is a bit like Zechariah, who's, who's made silent, and then in a moment, he is able to speak. So what a rush. There's Ezekiel. Uh, one overview. Thank you very much.